Marshner. I work for the New York State Hemlock Initiative. And um, I want to say thank you to the Agroforestry Resource Center and CCE Columbia Green and Connor for having me today to talk about hemlocks and HWA with you guys. Um, we're also partners with the Catskill Regional Invasive Species Partnership, which is the invasive species management entity for the Catskills um, and Western Green County portion of, of Columbia and Green, and with the Capital Region Prism, which is the similar entity for Eastern part of Green and for Columbia. And I'd like to acknowledge our funders um, and supporters, New York State DEC, the United States Forest Service, USDA APHIS, and the US EPA as well as individual donors. Um, can you guys let me know if, if you cannot identify a hemlock tree? Could you either unmute and tell me that or put it in the chat box? So I'm going to breeze very quickly through the identification of hemlock trees. Um, and hemlocks have rough furrowed brown bark that's dark bro grayish brown when it's young and then as the tree expands um, you start to see that reddish underbark that makes a beautiful red brown adult tree. The foliage is lacy and feathery and of course evergreen which um, is important as we'll discuss later and it droops the branches droop a little bit more than our other conifers instead of having that very upright form that like a pine tree does. The needles are short and flat, shiny and dark green in color with rounded tips oppositely arranged for the most part and also they're arranged in this um, compressed X shape like an X-wing fighter from Star Wars um, which is different from for instance, the, the balsam fir, which also has short needles. Hey, Carrie, one, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Are you uh, if you're uh, going through your slides, the screen isn't shared. It's not? No, I think you just have to share again. Okay. Let's try this. There it is. Yeah, we got it. All right, I'm going to go back. <laughs> okay. Um, there we are. We're acknowledging all of our partners. And there's the hemlock tree identification, bark, rough, furrow, brown, foliage, lacy, feather, green, needles, short and flat, opposite arrangement, with these distinctive white stripes on the underside. The cones are small, like two and a half inches. Um, they have these rounded scales, and they're brown when they're mature, although when they're immature, they're, the, the scales are held shut, and they're, they're almost a blue-green. And hemlocks are a foundation species. You may have heard of the concept of a keystone species, which is a big predator that um, the actions that it takes uh, control the ecosystem from the top down. A foundation species is almost the opposite of that. It's a very abundant plant that is the underpinning of or the foundation of an ecosystem and you just don't have the ecosystem without it. Um, so you can think of hemlock trees as habitat building blocks for a hemlock hardwood forest. Hemlocks fill a niche that uh, none of our other conifers are interested in and not all that many of our hardwoods are interested in. They grow in steep, on steep slopes and in shady places. They're actually uniquely adapted to shady environments for a conifer. They, their, their needles are specially equipped to photosynthesize even with those tiny little sun flecks that come through a, a heavy forest canopy. And that's why you'll see hemlocks often holding their branches well down towards the ground, which you won't see with a, with a pine tree or a spruce tree um, in, the middle of, in the middle of the woods. And they support a food web that is not quite the same as the hardwood forests around them and that they support about 400 species uh, including birds and mammals and lots and lots and lots of insects and other small things that, that then feed the rest of the food web. They also provide this unique habitat. The shade underneath a hemlock is up 
to 10 degrees cooler than the air above it. Um, so it's, when you walk into that hemlock grove in the summertime, it's cooler, shaded, feels really nice. And then in the winter, that evergreen foliage blocks the wind, and so it's warmer under the hemlocks. So a lot of our animals travel to hemlock stands in inclement weather to use them for shelter. Hemlocks provide a lot of ecosystem services. Uh, this is a, a geeky phrase that means that they do things for us that, um, that provide something that we that we use. Like, you know, all plants do that. But even though hemlocks are trees, they provide some services that specifically support our freshwater streams. Um, hemlocks hold because they have that evergreen shade that's low with the, the full canopy low down towards the ground, they, they hold snow on the ground farther into the spring, which provides cold water into our stream ecosystems later into the spring, which helps our cold streams stay cold. Um, they also because they're evergreens, they're taking up water out of the ecosystem uh, out of the ground in the spring and the fall when we have a lot of rain. And in the summer, when we're in drought situations, they're not as active as the hardwoods. And so they're taking water up when we have too much of it and they're not using it when we don't have enough. And when the hemlocks go, they get replaced by hardwoods, which do the opposite. And so what we've seen in recent research is that hemlocks, um, ecosystems that have HWA in them have flashier, flashier streams, which means that they, the flooding events are higher and the low events are lower than those that have hemlock in them. They also have these wide branching root systems that help filter nutrients out of the water as it comes down to the water. So they help keep our streams cold and clean and also keep the stream flows stable throughout the year. And that, all of that helps um, create this distinctive soil and water chemistry and temperature regimes that support uh, unique habitats. And you, you may already know this, but another um, old name for brook trout is hemlock trout. And that's because um, brook trout really like to be in, in watersheds that have a lot of hemlock. There was a study done in the Delaware Water Gap where they found up to three times as many brook trout in watersheds that have hemlock versus hardwood dominated watersheds. So why am I telling you this instead of just going and banging on DEC's door and telling them to treat all of the forests, which they're working on? Um, what's to do with forest stewardship? 76% of New York's forests are owned privately. And so the decisions that landowners make on their properties don't just affect what they hand down um, to the next generation. It also really impacts the future of New York's forests and, and of hemlocks in New York. This is where hemlocks are in New York. Um, can you see my cursor? Okay. Um, yeah, I know. Where you see the darker the green is, the more hemlocks there are, and the places where you see this brownish red, um, those are places where over 60% of the forest is hemlock trees. So the Adirondacks have a lot of hemlock. Tug Hill has a lot of hemlock, but so does the Catskills, especially right here in Western Greene County and this big stripe in um, Eastern Columbia County also, you can see some of those red speckles. There's a lot of hemlock in this region. That's really nice. They're the third most common tree in the state, um, which I was surprised by, given that I live in a sort of whitish Lake Plain area. Um, but I'm sure that's not as much of a surprise to you. And this is what we don't want for our forests. Um, this is Pisgah National Forest in the Southern Appala Appalachians. Um, and when you, when you lose a tree that's a lot of your forest, a high percentage of your forest, not only does it have significant impacts on the ecosystem, but it's also kind of heartbreaking to look at. 
So why did that happen in Pisgah? It's this pest, hemlock woolly adelgid. It's an invasive hemlock pest. Um, and let me just tell you a little bit about, about hemlocks globally. Um, there are several places that have hemlocks in the world. And um, all of the Asian hemlock species have HWA as a native hemlock pest. And so does the Western US. Um, and that means that this, it's a pest like the, the beach. You can find it, it's there, but it's not causing havoc in your forest ecosystems because it's been in those systems for a long time. And there, there are predators that exist to, to manage that, that pest. Um, and the trees are a little more to do the pest as well. We're the unfortunate, in the unfortunate situation of being the only region of the world that has <laughs> hemlocks and no native hemlock adelgid pest. So our trees were not accustomed to this kind of damage. And we don't have any native predators to, to no. that exponential growth from causing this widespread damage to, to our forests. Um, this is where HWA is in New York. Um, it started down near the city uh, in the 80s and it was moved up into the Catskills and the Lower Hudson region in that decade. And then by the late 80s, it had arrived, no, it arrived in the Finger Lakes in the late 90s, I think. Um, I wanted to tell you a few things about this. These two cities, Rochester and Buffalo, these are not extensions of that New York infestation. These are actually, in, these were independently infested by landscape, landscape trees that were purchased probably from mid-Atlantic states that had big HWA problems already. And mm -hmm. HWA just hopped a ride and those have been spreading from, from, from those um, initial start points. And then this was a 2017 find um, Prospect Mountain in the Adirondacks. It was three trees in the middle of a hillside that were just caught by luck. An old growth researcher went through, noticed the HWA and reported it. And DEC treated very aggressively and we have not seen any HWA in that area since then. And there was a similar situation here in Zora Valley, which is a, a really beautiful and unique natural area. Um, with hemlock dominated stream, stream sides. And they found HWA on two, two locations near the stream and they, again, DEC treated it very aggressively. That was 2015 and we still haven't seen HWA come back. Mm -hmm. nice. If you it early in your area and you treat it aggressively, um, you, can, you can really slow down this pest. Do you guys have any questions so far? No, I'm good. No, I'm good. All right. I'm going to move on to identification and biology of HWA. I wanted to tell you that the, once HWA arrives on the East Coast, um, the mortality is well over 90% for areas where it infests for hemlock. And in fact, in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, they are working very aggressively to treat enough trees to save 1% of their original hemlock population. So, um, we, have a, we have a unique situation where it's a really devastating pest, but there is a very effective management for it. This is what HWA looks like. Um, it's these white cottony waxy balls that are on the twig at the base of the needles. Um, right there. This is what the, the bug looks like if you look very closely and take off the wool. Um, it produces wool from these little pores here. And then this curly, curly straw looking thing is its straw like mouth parts that it puts down into the hemlock twig. And then it feeds on the starches that the hemlock stores for its own use. It's not the feeding that kills the trees, it's the damage that's caused by the insect putting its, its mouth parts into the tree. The, the, the tree walls that off, and that's not a big deal if you have a few of them, but when you have 
that many of them. Um, that causes enough scarring in the twig that the tree can't produce any new growth, which means that it can't um, it can't feed itself because it's not making any new growth, and that is what eventually kills the tree. Um, in the south, trees are dying in four years. Um, sometimes 10 if they're lucky. Up here we're seeing more like 6 to 20 years because we do get these um, cold snaps in the winter that can that can kill a lot of HWA but it almost never stops an infestation because these these insects reproduce asexually so any one bug that survives that cold snap just brings your infestation right back. The upside is that it does mean we have more time from the beginning of infestation until the tree is so damaged that it dies. I'm going to talk a little bit about how, about the life cycle of this insect and how it spreads. Um, one of the things that makes this insect so damaging is it has two generations per year. So it has this overwintering generation that um, the eggs are laid in the late spring or early summer. And then, um, and then there's a, a crawler stage and then four adult stages and then the adults start laying eggs for this second generation, the spring generation that develop, matures very quickly and then lays the eggs for the next overwintering generation. So when the eggs hatch, what emerges is a crawler. And this is the only mobile stage for HWA. And they hatch out of their eggs and they crawl around until they find um, a hemlock twig and they insert their little mouth parts. And once those mouth parts are in that, that insect can never move again from that location. And so that April to June window, which is when there are crawlers from both of the generations active, um, that's when you want to be careful about moving from one hemlock stand to the next if one of them is infested and the other one isn't because that's when you could move the HWA into new stands. Once those settler crawlers find a location and put their mouth parts in, they're considered settled. And the, in the summer, the summer, the overwintering generation does that in the early summer and then they enter this inactive dormancy period where they're not feeding, they're not doing anything, they're just hanging out on the tree waiting for fall. Um, it's called estivation. Uh, the, the spring generation doesn't do that. They just start feeding right away and they're growing. Um, so this is what HWA looks like in the summer. You can find it in the summer. Um, it looks like these teeny tiny little sesame seeds with the white fringe around of their, their early um, wool that they're, they've put on and they just hang out like this until actually we got our first rec reports of them breaking their dormancy, breaking estivation um, in Bath, New York just last week. So they're a little early this year. So you can find them but you can see that these are pretty magnified. So if you have good eyes you, you can find them with your naked eye but if you um, have a hand lens or a magnifying glass in the summer that does help. You can, if there's a lot of HWA though, you'll just see the wool from previous generations. So once they wake up in the fall or as soon as they settle in the spring, um, they start feeding and growing and putting on that, that wool that is so easy to see. And they're doing this November to June. Uh, the adults look like this, um, sort of almost pig like um, still very small. This has had the wool removed. Um, and then they start laying 50 to 100 eggs per piece. These little earwax colored um, balls are the, are the eggs. And they're laying eggs April and May. So if you look at this from the perspective of, a, of an individual hemlock twig, um, those, that overwintering generation um, as it's through the summer and then they grow and start putting on wool all the way through the winter. And then in the early spring they start laying eggs and then those offspring settle on the same twig um, in amongst their mothers. So you can see both the adult insects and the young, young next generation growing. 
And that's because the hemlocks haven't put on their new growth yet. They do that at the end of March, early June, they put on this beautiful lime green, very noticeable new growth. And that overwintering generation hatches just in time to, uh, to catch a ride on that new, that new growth. And this, this sort of double whammy of exponential growth happening twice in a, in a summer, that's, that's what's causing this to be such an aggressive pest in New York. So there, here we are with a heavily infested branch. So the, the, the three killer things about this bug is that they reproduce asexually. There are two generations a year and we have no predators that feed heavily on this insect. So there's nothing to check that extreme exponential growth. And that's why they're building up to such high populations that they're killing hemlock trees all over the eastern seaboard. No HWA population control. So what do you do? Especially in, in the region where you guys are, where this has been here for a while. You know, you, this is not an early detection situation for either Green or Columbia counties. There are really only two ways to manage HWA. You can use chemical management, or you can work really hard to try to develop a biological control. And right now, the only resource that's available to land managers is chemical control because we're working really hard on the biological control, but we don't have it yet. So what are your management options? Um, you can use horticultural oil. Um, the issue with horticultural oil is that it um, has to be reapplied every year, sometimes twice a year, and you have to have full foliar coverage for it to be effective. And that's hard on a, on a full-size tree. It works pretty well on hedges. But for a full-size tree, um, it's probably better to use imidacloprid or another sy systemic um, pesticide, which means it goes into the tree and it moves throughout the tree um, to provide coverage over the whole tree without your having to coat the whole tree. Um, imidacloprid is a slow acting chemical. It takes about a year after you treat for it to become effective, but then it lasts for several years, um, four to seven years. Um, there's another chemical called dimetephurin, which works very quickly, but is only useful for about a year. Pairing the two can be very effective in a, a couple of situations, um, either if you are in the Adirondacks where they don't have any fines yet, and you really need to do that rapid response to stop a new infestation in a new region, you would want to use both um, to make sure you kill everything that's there right away before it has a chance to reproduce. The other situation where you would use both is if you missed an infestation, by the time you notice your tree, you're really, really sick. Um, you then adding the dinotephion, the fast acting chemical can give your tree immediate relief so it doesn't die in that intervening year while you're waiting for the imidacloprid to kick in. But it's about three times as expensive as just using the imidacloprid. So I would recommend in most situations, just the imidacloprid is fine. You can apply the imidacloprid um, by yourself as a soil drench. It's available in several formulations. Um, you just search for um, imidacloprid only soil drench for trees and you get about 18 different choices. Um, or you can hire, if you want to use dinotephuron, you have to hire a commercial applicator. And the best management practice is probably to hire a contractor because they can do what this gentleman is doing, which is a basal bark application. Instead of pouring the chemical into the ground and then it gets picked up by any plant that has roots in that area. Um, this applies the chemical straight to the bark of the hemlock tree and that keeps it more just in that hemlock tree instead of being, it's, it's more, a more targeted application. Metacloprid is a neonicotinoid. Neonicotinoids are the most common um, Insecticide in use globally is what neonicotinoids are, what is, are in your flea and tick collars. So 
for your pet get dogs and cats. Um, it's what is on 98% of the agricultural seed that is planted in New York. Um, but they do have some negative impacts. Um, and I want to share why I think this is one of the best situations to make the decision to use this kind of chemical. One of them is that because metacloprid is really keyed to um, insect nervous systems, it doesn't have off-target impacts on other classes of animals as much. So it's not going to impact your pets. It's not going to impact you. Um, one of the reasons it's in use so much is that it replaced, it has been replacing organophosphates, which were also effective, but were pretty hard on humans. Um, this is a very low risk situation for using an imidacloprid for pollinators because hemlock trees are wind pollinated. They don't produce nectar and they are not of any interest to pollinators. And so they're not coming to hemlock trees. So the, the um, application to a hemlock tree is not likely to impact your pollinator populations. And you only have to apply them once every several years, which is great. And the doses are really low for this particular application compared to some of those other uses that I discussed. And the other thing is that not treating your hemlocks is not a no risk situation. If you don't treat your hemlocks, your hemlocks are going to die. And all of the uh, animals and other plants that relied on that habitat that's created by this foundation species are going to be negatively impacted. And so you have to weigh the, the risks of using, using a chemical in your property versus the eco ecological disruption of losing a foundation species. The other thing you can do is biological control. We love biological control because you certainly can't keep treating the hemlocks in New York forever. We have to have a long-term solution. And um, we also need a landscape scale solution because if you own more than a few hemlock trees, you're not gonna be able to treat them all. And so if we wanna save hemlocks across the landscape instead of individual specimen trees, we really, we really need biological control because that a biological control is um, an insect or a pathogen that you release into the environment that integrates into the e ecosystem and um, provides long-term management. There have been some great examples of this being very successful, and one of them is um, purple loosestrife, which, um, which you used to see all over the place. It was one of the biggest threats to wetlands about 25 years ago. And then 20 years ago, they released um, a seed predator for that that has done an excellent job at managing purple loosestrife. You still see it on the roadsides and in, in the wet ditches, but it's not taking over the way it used to because as soon as the population starts to build up, this predator finds it and starts eating the seeds so it can't do that exponential growth. But biological control research takes a really long time. And that's why we need management in the interim so that there are still hemlock trees in New York by the time we figure this out. And this, this is the unhappy situation that the southern states are in, is that the biological control research is continuing to develop um, all over the eastern seaboard. But in the, in the south, they've lost most of their hemlocks already. So what does biological control research look like? First, when you discover that you have a new pest, a new invasive species, researchers go to the place where that species came from and look at what's managing it and um, pick up, figure, figure out what it is that's managing that pest. And then there's a very careful vetting process where um, you work through the list of all of those, those um, pests that you found and figure out which ones are very specific. So they're not going to um, get into a new system and start 
feeding on something else uh, other than what you want them to feed on. Um, these two, between the two of them, they can take up to 15 years just to get through these first two steps. Our, our lab at the Hemlock Initiative is certified both by the federal government and by, by New York State to, to um, work with the biological controls that we are working with. And then once you have that done, then you can start looking at whether the, the um, species that you've narrowed down to will be able to, to um, successfully control your invasive species in your environment. So we're working with two species. One of them is um, Laracobius beetles, mainly Laracobius nigrinus, which is native to the Pacific Northwest, where if you remember, there's, there's HWA out there that's managed by predators. This is one of the most common predators. And it feeds on HWA the way hemlocks, uh, the way HWA feeds on hemlock trees. It's a very specific specialist predator. And since 2008, we've released over 9,000 of them in New York. <coughs> there they are, our little Larry, um, munching on some, some HWA in our lab. So a lot of what we do is we go out to the Pacific Northwest, collect beetles, and then release them in New York, and then go back to every place that we've released beetles every year and look to see where they have established. Because if you release a beetle like this, it flies to where the HWA is, which is usually way up high in the canopy. And then you can't find it, even if it's established. So it's taken us up to nine years to start determine whether or not our releases have been successful at some sites. Hmm. Uh, more recently, we've been working with Leucopus silverflies. This is actually two very closely related species that we work with. Another abundant Pacific Northwest predator that eats the eggs rather than the adults. So you get predators feeding at different parts of the life cycle, trying to manage that exponential growth. And we've this is actually an old number. As of now, we've re released um, almost 17,000 in New York. This is um, one of our lab, this is our lab manager doing uh, a release of silverflies. They're in this little net cage and we go back to see how they're doing um, a few times over the season when we're doing our research runs. So we're doing a lot of the same things as that we're doing with Laracobius with this one, except because it's newer, newer to us, we're also trying to figure out some rearing techniques, um, looking at ways to identify a different population and figuring out these two species are, we collect them in the same locations, they're living together, but they emerge at slightly different times. We're trying to figure out how they're divvying up the, the resource of HWA to support both species. So even, even in the midst of COVID, we were super lucky um, that we had, usually we make four trips in the spring and early summer out to the Pacific Northwest to collect um, foliage for these two species. And of course, we got the first one in and then, and then COVID happened and we couldn't do any more travel, but we were really fortunate that we had some great collaborators out there who were able to send us some hemlock foliage so that we could continue our research and do some more releases this year. The other good news is that those Laracobius beetles that we've been releasing, we found them established at five different sites in New York. So progress is being made. And we do believe that biological control is going to be a great option for um, hemlocks and HWA. They're just not ready for prime time. So how can you guys help um, preserve, conserve hemlocks in New York? It's great to know your prism. Um, these, New York is really lucky. We have the most, um, one of the most comprehensive invasive species management plans and networks of any Eastern state. We have these great uh, regional invasive species partnerships um, that cover the whole state between the eight of them. and um, the Catskills and Capital Region prisms are the ones that cover the Columbia and Greene counties. And they're both wonderful organizations with lots of 
wealth of resources to share with, with um, landowners and community members. If you're a landowner, go out, find your hemlock trees and look to see if they reach the helium. And then if you find it, treat it. Um, I believe that Connor has, has um, some, a list of, of people that are available who do these, this kind of um, treatment in these counties. Well, uh, for, for starters, we provided in the chat, you can see the link to the New York State Arborist site. And that's, they have a great tool in locating an arborist who really focuses on individual tree health. Uh, there's also foresters if you're looking at uh, managing, your, managing your, your forest block and uh, for resilient and healthy woods. Uh, if there are other applicators and that is a state uh, basically awarded certification and you can talk to your local landscaper um, if and, and kind of gauge their experience and an understanding of tree treatment rather than lawn or garden so uh, the arborist link is there and um, if you ever have any questions you can always reach out to us here we also a couple of years ago we did a survey um, where we emailed every pesticide applicator that was certified for tree applications and asked them if they did these treatments and anybody who answered got put on a list. Um, and so if you are interested in that, we can e email me and I'll, I'll send you that list as well. Um, we do have a volunteer program called My Hemlock, um, which is specifically for landowners or for people who like to hike in a specific place or fish in a specific place where they see the same trees over and over again. Um, you pick one survey site with hemlock trees and you go out and check it twice a year for HWA and let us know what you find. Um, but either no HWA or how much HWA. And that really helps us track um, the HWA populations as they go up and down based on what the weather's been like in that area the previous winter. Um, and that's really important for us as we communicate with people like you and also as we do our biological control releases. So this my hemlock program helps us find new HWA infestations, it helps us monitor existing infestations and the tree health in different regions, it helps slow the spread by um, helping us identify places where treatment might be needed on public lands, if you pick a public stand. And then, as I said, it helps us understand the fluctuating HWA populations. And so what you do is you, you go to our website and sign up as a My Hemlock volunteer, and then you register your site, or as many sites as you want, and then you survey twice a year. If you're not a landowner, um, but you still, and you still want to help conserve hemlocks, go to a place that has hemlocks and survey for HWA and report what you find. Whether you find it or HWA or not, both a negative or a positive finding is really useful for us because that helps us. It's great to know where HWA is, but it's also great to know that someone has been somewhere and looked and hasn't found it. Otherwise, you just have this blank spot on your map and you say, is it not here or is nobody looking? Um, and we have that problem in um, the Western Crisp region, sort of Northwest of the Catskills. We have this big blank area, but I, it's not necessarily because there's no HWA, it's because nobody's looking there other than DEC. So we have points from DEC, but we don't have any other points yet. When you're looking for HWA, it's easiest to do it November through May, which is when, when the, you have the nice, fresh, big, woolly balls that are easy to find. Um, if, you're, if you have a bunch of trees and you're trying to figure out where to look, you might start with the sick ones because if you have HWA, what you're going to see is this graying, thinning canopy. And in some cases, you'll see what we call lollipopping, where you'll have um, a, a, a crown at the top that has healthy foliage and then everything else is dead. And we see that in, in um, dense HWA or dense hemlock forests where there's been HWA for several years. If you can't reach branches to survey them, uh, you, especially in the winter, you can look for branches that are on the ground. Porcupines like to go up to the top of hemlock trees and feed up in the canopy and then they, the twigs that they're done with, they drop. 
And so you can pick those up off the ground and it will give you a good um, peek into what's happening at the top of that tree. You can just survey those twigs on the ground for HWA. It's easiest, of course, to just grab the branches you can reach, either just by grabbing it or you can use a ski pole or a hook to pull down some of the lower branches to survey. And when you grab it, turn it over because generally HWA is on the underside of the, of the twig, although when the stations are very dense, you'll see a few on them. It's good to check branches on all sides of the tree. You remember I said that it's just one insect that starts an infestation? That infestation starts wherever that, wherever that bug happened to crawl off onto that tree. And so the infestations are very spotty. And so it's a good idea to check several sides of the tree if you can. Um, if the crown is the only viable part of the tree, is it still possible to treat or worth treating? Generally, yes. Um, we have a, a health scale that we use that talks about the, you know, how much of the crown is left and how thin it is. And what we found that we, we, have, a, we have a rule of thumb cut off at about 30% live crown left. But um, New York State Parks, the Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Places, um, they have in some situations gone in and realized they have some really important trees that are, are worse off than that and have gone ahead and just treated it as a Hail Mary to just see if it'll work in it. It sometimes works. So um, if you really love the tree, or um, the, the whole stand has gotten kind of out of hand and you really want to keep that stand in the landscape, can't hurt to try. Um, but generally we say if, if it's got at least 30% of its crown left, it's probably, it'll probably bounce back if you treat it. If you're out on the water, um, it's actually a great, a great way to look for HWA. Keep an eye out for ghost trees. As, as trees go down to HWA, their foliage gets gray and thin. Um, and a great time to look is late May, early June, when, when those lime green new buds are coming out because they're really easy to see. They look like that. You can see them from a long ways away. And so if you see hemlocks that don't have that, you know something's going on with those trees and you can prioritize those trees for, um, for an HWA survey. That's what a healthy crown looks like for, um, for a hemlock. You can see this drooping leader tip, which is sort of one of the diagnostic traits for hemlock and the gently drooping branches that I was talking about earlier. Green foliage with the new growth, and that's a ghost tree. Well, we have a lot of those um, on our lake, Cayuga Lake, I'm sorry to say. And then once you see trees like that, um, if they're right on the water, you can paddle, paddle or motor up to it and just look. And you can, even from here, you can see the HWA on this guy. You can see all those little white dots on the foliage. Um, to report HWA, probably the best thing to do is to go to IMAP Invasives. This is an amazing resource that we have in New York. You just sign up and um, when you and you can even download an app that they have which is what I use when I'm hiking and I see lesser celandine or something like that um, you just open the app you take a picture you tell it what species you found and hit up. and that report goes into the IMAP invasives website and every land manager in the state can see it it's an amazing way to get information into the hands of the people who need it right away um, if you don't love smartphones or you're just not comfortable with that technology, you can just go to our website and um, we have a report HWA finding and you just fill in some, you know, where you found it, what the GPS point was and, or, or an address and add a photo and, and send it to us and then we'll know where, where that finding was. Or you can call the DEC Forest Pest Line um, and they, they, they will also take HWA findings there. So this is what was going on in the Catskills um, as of a few weeks ago. And, uh, the green dots are where HWA has been found. Um, 
you saw in that earlier state map that that HW has been in this area for a while. So it's not that much of a surprise that we have points all over, but this, this section is weirdly blank. And I'm actually not sure if that's because uh, it's not there yet, or if it's because nobody looked there yet. Um, and then over here, there's a bunch of finds as well, but not as many, just because not as many people are looking down in the, in the, Hudson, in the Hudson Valley area as are looking in the Catskills. And then this area up in the northwest um, of this map, that's that big blank space that I said we don't have a lot of data up there. The, um, the most recent news that we have from the state perspective is not, not the kind of news that I want to bring to you guys, and that is that um, this summer, a gentleman from Long Island was camping up on Lake George and he had HWA in his backyard, he saw it at his campsite and said, that's funny. I didn't think there was HWA in, in the Adirondacks. And so he uploaded a point to IMAP. Um, and the state went out, didn't find it, but thought they'd just check again because it's so important, um, HWA in the Adirondacks, because they have so much hemlock up there. And they did. They confirmed, they confirmed his finding and my boss and a couple of my colleagues have been up with DEC and um, APIP, which is the prison for the Adirondacks and the Lake George Land Conservancy and some other folks have been surveying all around these three points. And they found light infestations along about a mile and a half of shoreline. Um, so this would have been a great place if we had had people out on the water looking for sick trees because we might have been able to find it a couple of years earlier. So DEC is, is moving very aggressively to treat this this fall. The, the, the windows to this treat are in the fall and the spring. Spring is actually best um, if you're thinking about doing applications on your own property. Um, and they're hoping that they can manage this infestation. Because right uphill of it, this, this whole area is it's like 90% hemlock. Um, in the beaver kill, we, we actually have a, a, one of our lab technicians living in the beaver kill this year and surveying beaver kill properties. And we have a tool on our website called the uh, Hemlock Prioritization Tool, which is kind of a geeky way of saying, if you have more trees than you know how to treat, how do you pick the ones that are important? And so you can download this tool and um, it has a Word document that will walk you through um, what are the important things to think about for hemlock conservation on your property. Um, Connor just put the link in the chat. And, um, and then there's an Excel file if you're feeling um, like you want to get very quantitative about it where you can score your stands for these various things or as many of them use, as you have information on. And it'll, it'll tell you which are the higher, more important stands to conserve or less important. So we did that here. And what you're looking at is the red one, the red blobs are the high priority stands. And then they go through red and yellow down to lower, lowest priority stands in green. And the red spots are HWA. So our colleague Kate started there with this map. And she's been at it for nine months now. And this is what she has found. Um, this is just her positive records. She's been to all the high priority stands. So the ones that don't have points, hooray, they didn't have HWA, but this was way more HWA than we expected to find in the beaver kill. And that's why we want to get more people down on the, down on the ground looking at their property and, um, and reporting HWA because um, there's, there's no substitute for just getting humans out in the landscape looking for a pest. My final thoughts are, we really can't rely on these, these cold winters to manage this pest for a couple of reasons. We don't get a good cold snap every winter um, and HW is continuing to spread despite the polar vortex of 2014, 2015. And also HWA is adapting. So the HWA from Northern states is, uh, can survive lower temperatures than the HWA from Southern states. So 
they're becoming more tolerant as they move north, more cold tolerant. So cold winters are not going to save us from HWA. Um, surveys and treatments are critical to keep hemlocks in our landscape. And um, biocontrol will really move us forward with this pest if we can figure out how to implement that. Um, if there are still if people have been conserving their hemlocks, by the time we get the biocontrol figured out, um, we can we can have a long-term solution for this for this forest pest. That's it. You can visit our website for the prioritization tool for more information on our volunteer programs and for all sorts of information on HWA. Um, we are on social media and you can email us at New York State Hemlock, NYS Hemlock Initiative at cornell.edu. That's all I have. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have a couple minutes in case anyone had any questions? Absolutely. I'm sorry I talked for the whole hour. No, no, it's great. I, so if anyone does have any follow up or specific questions, um, you can either enter them into the chat or unmute yourself and ask. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Christine. Thank you. That was incredibly helpful. Really